morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me. Good morning, good morning. I'm going to uh, check my comments. I was looking for my phone. I'm all in a different location and I have no idea what I'm doing this morning. I can just about remember my own name. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know my own name, I'm Krista from Sunshine Support, and I'm on Facebook Live this morning to talk to you about the summer holidays and see how you're all getting on, see if you've got any questions for me. Um, in fact, I am going to grab my mobile because the way that this is set up, I can't see any of the comments. So do say hello if you can see me. Let me know where you're watching from. Um Oh goodness me, I'm watching myself back now, playing my voice. Is there anything more irritating than your own voice? There is nothing more irritating than your own voice. So if you can see me, do say hello. Oh, there we go. We've got lots and lots of people watching. Thank you. Little sticky bum time then. Squeaky bum time, not sticky bum. <laughs> oh God, how bad are your summer holidays if you've got a sticky bum? Okay, so... Oh, we've got some lovely things coming in this morning. Good morning, Kat. Good morning, Jess. Good morning, Sunshine Support, whoever you are. <laughs> I reckon probably Katie. Uh, good morning, Louise. Louise says, morning, everyone. Hope we are all coping as best we can do in the summer holidays. And do you know what? It's really tricky because... Let's get myself all sorted here, guys. Um, so many of us love the summer holidays because there's no school and we're not having to deal with the hundreds of emails every day and all the notifications and all the different types of software that we're expected to download and understand what the hell's going on. Um, and the constant phone calls about behavior and the constant phone calls about everything. Um, and just the admin. I know that for me, one of my kids, um, it's not her fault, but um, sadly the placement that she's in comes with a whole heap of admin <laughs> and I haven't missed it. I have not missed it. And for me, my blood pressure is down. I'm not having anxiety the way that I normally do. I don't have these worries about sending her anywhere because she's with me. Um, and, and I think many of us can relate. But I, I have, as many of you know, um, several children. And one of my children, um, for her, the, the school holidays were really tricky because they didn't have a routine. So actually, I used to dread the school holidays because they weren't a time for downtime. She was a child who masked. So in school, I didn't have the whole heap of emails. I didn't have all the admin and everything else. But actually, at home, things were really, really tricky. And you know, home was her safe place. And that was really, really hard because that's where we saw the behaviors. And that's where we had to undo and unpick and try and get to the root cause of what's gone on. But also that structure and routine was very, very important to her day to day. So without it, oh, honestly, I feel uptight thinking about it. So every child is different. Every parent is different. Some of us as parents love that school routine, love the fact that you know, we've got a reason to get up in the morning, get them shipped out and off to school. Um, and some of us really fall apart without the routine. And I think, you know, regardless of neurodivergence, regardless of how your brain functions in terms of, you know, I have ADHD, so I hate routine. Um, I love a bit of chaos. But what I need is routine because if I stay in that chaotic state for too long, then I become really, really dysregulated. So there's a whole heap of layers of stuff that goes on in the school holidays. And then, of course, we've got the childcare element. I've been discussing this with my colleague this morning, well, yesterday and this morning, and the fact that there's no way that she could put her child into childcare because there is no childcare that would be able to help her, her child. There's no childcare that is SEND friendly. And can you imagine the cost of that? Because you know, the government needs to sort this out, really, and let's hope we've got a bit of a change. But if you think about, you know, if you have a child that is normally used to having a um, very high level of 
uh, input during the day in school with a one-to-one -one and a very bespoke curriculum and they their brain is actually developing at a, at a different rate to what is typical for their age then actually childcare during the school holidays is non-existent um, which is why I know a lot of our staff love working at Sunshine because actually they can work around their kids um, it doesn't mean that they're unemployable um, and again, you know, employers can sometimes not be very flexible about these things. And childcare is a difficult thing to source and a difficult thing to afford. Um, I remember earlier on in my career where I worked for someone else. And when my daughter was starting school, I said to them, oh, in the first week, they do an hour in the morning and then they come home or they do an hour in the afternoon and then they come home. But I can work from home. My boss was having none of it. And she said, you're not taking the week off. I've got too many other people off. Um, if I find that you're working from home and managing this strange schedule of school attendance, you know, and, and the, the, the reception first week, um, then you will get the sack. And I thought, I'm in an absolutely impossible situation. There is absolutely no childcare that will deal with that, where I say to them, can you take her from 10 to 11? And also, I wanted to be the person taking my child to school on the first week of school. So I think I did a bit of a dodgy play, to be honest with you, and just said, I'm in meetings traveling around the country, so I won't be in the office. <laughs> Uh, because there was no other way for me to do it but of course it just leads us to being dishonest doesn't it anyway <laughs> got that little ADHD path there which is uh, very very typical of my brain um Sadie says I need tips on how to help my autistic daughter deal with the new places we visit over the summer she hates the thought of anywhere new and the reality of it takes her a day to warm up to things yes now there are several ways to approach this and I don't know your daughter so I'm going to give you some ideas um, and some of you might find this helpful. Um, I've got an autistic child and actually for that particular autistic child, um, we found that actually giving her too much notice, well, she's actually got PDA as well. So there's an extra layer of complexity there, but giving her too much notice gave her more time to really stew over it. And her anxiety would creep up to the point where that, demand avoidance would kick in because of the anxiety so she couldn't even though she's incredibly intelligent she couldn't quite work out what her anxiety was um relating to and so it made it very difficult for her to then relay those questions to us so it could you know she could never have said to me um i'm worried about the volume of people that will be at that particular place. Um, and she probably couldn't even say that to herself. So it made it really, really hard to get things done. <clears throat> Over time, and when she attended a specialist school, we got to unpick all that stuff. And actually it was, it was much more straightforward. So one of the things that I think, regardless of the presentation of your child, get them involved in the planning. So if they have, and I know this is tricky if you have a child with PDA, because actually they can avoid the demands of their own interests and inspirations and motivations. And I get that. Um, and we're not going to be sort of touching on that today. We've got loads of webinars on that on our Sunshine Academy, if you wanted to have a look. But if you have a child, any child, autistic, ADHD, DLD, any child will have executive function. If they have SEND, they will have executive function impairment. It's very, very unlikely and, oh, very, very likely, sorry. And one of the things with executive function impairment is transitions um, and also planning. So actually, if you can assist them to plan that activity with you and you do lots of visuals. So with my kids, what I tend to do is we will draw something out. So we'll we'll make we'll get pens and paper. We'll get really really crafty. We'll get around the kitchen table, and we will write a list of all the things that we would love to do during the summer holidays. And then we pick five top ones, and then we start to explore those in more detail. So maybe the kids will start to draw pictures. Um, and believe me, whilst it doesn't sound like this is related to the actual thing that you're going to do, it absolutely helps. So doing those visual things, getting them used to what that environment is going to be so that it starts to prompt those questions they might have. Mum, 
how many people do you think there will be there? What will the temperature be like? Will the animals I want to see be at the farm? Or will the fireworks be too loud? Will I need to take my ear defenders? It helps you to plan the day. It also helps them to understand whether it's worth them going. Because one of my kids, uh, she has DLD, developmental language disorder, um, and to the untrained eye, it looks a lot like autism, but she there is there are certain things that she doesn't present with that a, a typical autistic child will present with. And one of the things is rigidity. However, she can look quite rigid if something isn't, uh, if it's going to dysregulate her. She's very, very good at spotting if something is going to dysregulate her. And if she enters into that dysregulation, then she becomes very rigid because she's trying to protect herself. She feels unsafe. She perceives danger. So we do a lot of planning with her. And sometimes she'll say to me, I really want to go to that place. But the, the more I think about it, the more I don't think it's going to be worth it because I'm going to become more dysregulated. And I'm try she tries to weigh up the options, you know, the pros versus the cons. And she needs a lot of assistance with that. You know, she's not some sort of, emotional child genius or anything <laughs> um she has a lot of input and a lot of coaching and a lot of therapy they're not it's not a happy accident that she does this but it all stems from doing that work where which is child-centered everything has to be based around your child I'm not saying any of this is easy by the way none of this is easy okay this is like send parent tax as I call it um where we have to do so much more as send parents than you would do for children who don't present with any sort of special educational need or disability. But it's that planning ahead, doing visuals. For them, maybe drawing and sketching isn't their thing. Maybe doing some Play-Doh is their thing. Remember, when their hands are busy, it makes it easier to access those thoughts in the brain. Um, there are certain activities you can do to get your child thinking more. Um, about these different things but one of the things that I think is most important about these tasks is that the child feels as though they're in control of that but also they feel that they're connected to you so if they feel in control of an activity that they are you know they've given you the idea you've then helped them to map out how it's all going to look you then talk to them about the different times of day that you're going to go, whether you're going to have food, whether you're going to take food, whatever it may be. But they have, it is an illusion of being in control. And what I mean by this, I'm not trying to say that we're manipulating our children. Regardless of all this gentle parenting stuff that we talk about, and this is all fits in with that gentle parenting and being child-centered, you still have to parent. You still have to keep them safe. You still have to put boundaries in place to keep them safe. There are still rules. You can't just let them run amok. Um, so it is very much an illusion that they're fully in control. Um, and they are in control of a lot. Um, but you don't have to allow yourself to be controlled by this situation, if that makes sense. And again, that's something that's really, really tricky to master, that balance. Um, it's really tricky. Uh, but I hope that's given you a bit of a flavor for something. I think that child-centered working um, and going along with it, you know, the, the level of planning that you have to do is sort of determined by the child. Um, and like I said, one of my children, she needs lots of planning. Another one of my children needs no planning. She much prefers if you just say, we're going to do this today, let's go. And that to her is more uh, is a more optimal way of working. She gets the best out of it because she's not sat there absolutely stewing. Let me see what other comments we've got. Um, morning, Mel. Mel says her son keeps waking at 2 a.m. and she's so tired. Mel, if you, I know I've seen your name so many times. So I recognize your name, even though we don't know each other. I don't think we know each other anyway. Um, if you are on the Sunshine Academy, we've got a really brilliant sleep course. So we've got the regular webinars, but we've got a course that's just on sleep and it's by Kerry Davis. Now, Kerry talks a lot about this regular waking up at certain times. Um, and she talks about the sleep pressures and what you can do to stop him from waking at 
two o'clock and it doesn't involve medication because it's all about that sleep uh the circadian rhythm the sleep rhythm um so if you're on the sunshine academy i would absolutely recommend watching that because kerry or reach out to kerry on facebook she's called the sleep fixer it's really really fascinating um i with, with my kids i've got uh my my pda i really struggled with sleep um my others don't tend to struggle with sleep but i've got one that presents very much like an ADHD, which we're thinking actually is probably more developmental trauma. So that's something we're going through at the moment. And sometimes she can struggle to, to sleep. But I think it's the busyness of her uh, thoughts in her brain, because I'm very much the same. I can either literally, as the Welsh say, sleep on a chicken's lip, <laughs> or I really struggle to sleep. And it's like three o'clock in the morning before I get to sleep. But if you have a, a child who's waking up at the same time every night, there'll be a reason for that. And there's something you can do. And I don't want to give you the advice because I'm not a sleep expert, but please, please, please do watch those courses or watch the webinars. Um, there's tons on the Sunshine Academy on this. So I hope that helps. Um, Katie, brilliant idea. This is not something I do with my kids because they don't necessarily need this sort of approach but it's something that I have created for others and that's social stories so some children respond really really well to social stories um in fact one of my the, my PDA one of we didn't do social stories because I think she would have probably ripped them up and thrown them in my face um but one of the things we used to do when she really wanted to do something so for instance she wanted to have her hair highlighted and so what we had to do was, was look, sorry, I'm really thirsty, um, was look online at the hairdresser, look at the pictures of all the hairdressers and then leave her with that information for a bit. This took about four or five months, by the way. Uh, leave her with that information for a little bit. Then she came to me and said, will you drive me to the hairdressers so I can just drive past it? So we drove to the hairdressers and she drove past it. She wanted to do that three or four times. And by the way, <laughs> That can look like stalking behavior. There's absolutely a purpose behind it, okay? So never judge someone if they're driving past the hairdressers. <laughs> um, a lot. Um, so then she wanted to come in and make the appointment with me, but the appointment needed to be like two months ahead so she could do some more prep. So we went in and we made the appointment. She stays silent. Um, she does have selective mutism. We made the appointment. Um, and then I also have my hair done by this hairdresser so then she came in with me whilst I had my hair done got used to it worked out what she needed um she needed to be on her phone the entire time in order to focus so she completely prepped herself for that experience now social stories can do the same sort of thing so particularly if you can get your hands on some photos because the more real you can make this the better particularly if we've got very literal thinkers okay um and my daughter would have been one of these so if i'd done a social story and we used to do videos and videos are really really good um I've got a very, very close family member who's worked in the education sector for decades um, in specialist education. And she's a huge fan of making bespoke videos for the child. But one of the things that we have to be very careful about is if you have some a child that's a very literal thinker, then what we need to focus on and what we need to feature in the video is the people who are going to feature in their day. So there's no point in sort of saying to your next door neighbor, can you quickly go and film yourself getting on a bus and explaining, you know, everything to do with, you know, what when the what the bus timetable is and everything. Because if that, that person is not going to be on the trip with you, then your child's going to feel quite confused by it. But social stories can they can help in a variety of ways. So you can do the very sort of um the widget based stuff, widget software, give them a Google. Um, you can do that sort of visual uh drawings. Or you can do pictures, you can do videos. There's all sorts of stuff you can do these days because you've got a very uh, accessible uh, software and things like that to, to be able to do it. Um, Lucy says, I'm struggling with this too. My son just wants to stay in his room with his screens, but my neurotypical son wants to go out and do activities. I'm a single mum and so it's impossible. Honestly, I don't think there's a magic wand. And I really, really wish there was a magic wand. Um, and this is something I see so much and my heart breaks because that sibling is really missing out 
because of the child with additional needs. But then when we flip it and we say, but the additional needs child needs to re-regulate, needs to sort of decompress. And so their screen time is very important to them. Um, one of my kids needs planned downtime. This is one of the things that I think really works for us as a family. Um, in fact, I've got uh, a little schedule here. It's just my schedule, not the kids' schedule, but it's something that we put together ourselves together. Um, let me see. So we've got, yeah, you know, Monday, yesterday, we had, I had work all day and then we had um, activities all evening and uh, a meal. Now, whilst I was working, I said, OK, screen time can happen whilst I'm working. And then screens go off, they get locked away and we all go out for a family meal. And that really, really worked well. Um, we then had uh, we've got another activity day. So today is screen time because I'm working all day. But tomorrow I'm not working. So we have an activity day. So on an activity day, we say, OK, screens away. However, if we find that my child who needs that little bit of extra, um, if she really needs to take something with her, then she will. One of the things that she has is she has like a survival kit. <laughs> she calls it, well, it, it's like a little, it's a little Adidas bag that she puts around her waist. A bit like a bum bag, but it's not. I think it's a mobile phone one. It's meant to go over your shoulder, but she likes it around her waist. She calls it a pouch and in there, she, it's a little magic bag of tricks. So for her, she loves Tic Tacs. So that's a very sensory thing. Um, she's got a certain perfume in there, that a mini one uh, of mine, because it makes her feel nice when she smells it, because it makes it makes a reminder of me. Um, she also has her loop earplugs, um, and she can take a device of some variety. Now, my kids don't have phones. I'm not a parent who allows that. So, um, but there will be devices that she will be able to get her hands on, like maybe a switch or something. Maybe I'll take it in my bag, a Nintendo. So there'll be flexibility to this is what I'm saying. We can't be rigid. Um, and then Sunday, we've got a full, we've got then downtime and we've got flexible downtime for three days before we then go and do some more activities on Sunday. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're working next week. And so the girls are then going to have to um, do some screen time, decompress. But also I've got a big bag of, uh, or big box of different games. So things like Uno, things like um, basic stuff, the 80s games, Snakes and Ladders, um, Ludo, you know, that sort of stuff. Kids love that because it's really unusual. Um, but they can also have their screen time during that time. And then Thursday, we know we're going to do an activity. So the activity then will be like I've just mentioned. So planning those down times is really, really important. And, and saying to your kids, you know, be honest with them, guys, I've got an impossible job here. Desperately want to make you both happy. Completely get that you need to have your screen time, you need to be at home and you need to be able to feel safe. I also get that you wanna go out to the trampoline park or whatever. Can we make some sort of deal where if we go to the trampoline park, then we can do something for you? Um, and, you know, I don't know what your kids are like. My kids seem to be okay with that. Um, I've got three little ones at home um, and I say little, actually, I, I'm quite sad because my littlest batch are twins and uh, they're about to turn 10. So it's not so little anymore, but anyway. <laughs> um, so they are very, very good at, you know, we're trying to negotiate a way through it and there will be squabbles, but encourage them to have that. Encourage them. We always sort of shy away from this sort of negative discussions, don't we? Encourage them to hash it out. Sometimes, you know, particularly the same sibling will say, I just think it's unfair. I think it's unfair that I always have to blum and pander to my siblings' needs just because they've got additional needs. Let them get it out of their system. It's good. My, my therapist always says it's good to protest. It's about how we do it and how it's managed. Um, so have those difficult discussions, but manage them very, very carefully. Um, I hope that helps. Katie says... Lack of send care, a uh, child care is a massive problem. It really is. There is no send child care. Um, I thought I found one last year and they are very, very good. But some of the comments made towards the end of my children's um, time there really upset me. Um, they were really not what I expected 
the outside world to be. I guess I'm in my sunshine bubble. So I assume people just have this level of acceptance and use of language. And I always assume that people working in education or childcare naturally want to learn more about this stuff. And it kind of made me realize that they don't. Um, sorry to ask. Sorry, guys. Could you pass me my drink, please? <laughs> I'm so thirsty this morning. Thank you so much. My Illuminous Nootropics drink. By the way, this isn't an advert, but if you have any sort of cognitive lack of focus or maybe fatigue, this stuff is better than any caffeine drink that you will drink. It's called Nootropics. And I get mine from a company called Will Powders, and it's absolutely fantastic. It is fueling my son. <laughs> it's brilliant. Anyway, lack of send childcare, absolutely huge, huge problem. Um, some places, even though they don't advertise that they are send friendly, are quite send friendly. I used to find um, I'm based in Derby. Derby County Football Club have um, a holiday club, and they were absolutely brilliant so inclusive really professional the people looking after the kids and doing all the sports were absolutely brilliant and they were not children um there's also another big um company who do out of school child care you know school holiday clubs and actually they're run by teenagers and so there's absolutely no way that you could allow your send children or your children. I wouldn't allow my children in their hands because they just don't seem old enough to understand it. And that's a really big company. And I've called them out quite a few times online for it and they just banned me from their pages. So <laughs> I do try, I do try. Um, morning, Claire. Claire says, back just in time from the usual no milk run to the shops. Um, and my husband's just gone, oh no, because he's just gone to the shop forgot my milk never mind it's okay i've got my new tropics i don't need coffee it's fine um pretty sticky here in yorkshire yeah it's so warm isn't it it's ridiculously warm uh, let's see what else we've got going on let me see if i've got any new comments do keep throwing me your messages um it takes forever for facebook to load them so bear with me and i will come back to them in just a second i can see there are lots um oh we love the new tropics in the sunshine office is what they've said so we're all a bit reliant on these things okay they're not only just bright green they come in uh, a nice uh strawberry and a pina colada flavor as well um and our sunshine just runs on these new tropics we buy a big batch for the staff every month that we have for like a well-being corner i must say self-care is so important during the summer holidays um I know it sounded like I did a bit of a squirrel moment there, um, but self-care comes in the way of looking after ourselves with things like this <laughs> um, and looking after our brains, looking after our, our own emotional regulation, because my goodness, it, it is so hard. Mel says, I would love my son to go to a summer camp, even for a day, but it's so hard when he has a separation anxiety. It is really, really hard. And again, you've got to put a lot of thought into how you... Um, do that transition now a school that i uh visited um a few terms ago really impressed me because they just acknowledge that children have separation anxiety particularly post covid remember you know our kids were stuck in a house with us feeling very attached to us um for ages i mean when you look back it was a long time wasn't it um and so they just accept that that is going to be a thing rather than battling it and ripping the child away from the parent. What they've done is they've said to parents, look, we acknowledge this is going to be a difficult thing. We also have a really good idea that we would like to roll out, but we need your help in funding it. It's only small, but we think it's going to have a huge impact. And so the community have come together because the school community feel very, very connected and they really want to do well and, and do the best by their children. And what they do is these morning clubs where parents go in and have breakfast, children go in and have breakfast, you're all in one room and slowly but surely that child or your child sort of severs their ties with you as you are talking over a coffee and a bagel to, you know, a fellow send, uh, fellow mum or dad. 
and the children just it's almost like a halfway house so it's in the school but it's not their classroom probably the school hall or something um and i think they call it bagel club and the kids determine what breakfast they have so when i was there it was about to become pancake it was about to be pancake day and the kids all said we want those rolled up crepes with chocolate in the middle and they knew which ones they wanted and i think they were from little aldi or something um and so the school business manager she said to me have you seen any because i have been around all the shops trying to find them and i have to get them for the kids they really really want them and she was so focused on it because she knew this meant the world to the children and they gave the children a voice and they gave the parents a voice and they said as a result of this they didn't tend to have school refusers or school avoiders um, because the children really felt included in the school they felt welcome they felt that their their voices were being heard they felt valid and it makes such a difference when you have those beautiful transition zones and I know it's hard, but this is actually a very, very big primary school. So it is doable. Um, it's all about the, the attitude of the school and also the, the ability for that community to come together. And again, you know, I talk a lot about this in my school avoidance webinar and how we create a solid, healthy school community. Um, and we'll be doing lots of work on that, by the way, because we've got school avoidance week coming up at the end of September. So if school avoidance is also something that your children's uh, your children's experience and they suffer from, um, particularly if they have separation anxiety, then I think you'll find that week really, really helpful. Um, so, yeah, it is really, really hard with separation anxiety. And there is, again, I wish I could come on and say, guys, I have found this magic wand. And I'm going to give you all one. I could be like, Oprah, you can have a wand and you can have a wand. <laughs> um, but sadly, I don't. I'm really sorry. Um, morning, Laura. Mum of seven. Seven. Ah, oh, you deserve a medal. Well, actually, more than a medal. That's incredible, Laura. I've got four and I feel busy. Really busy. So you must feel really, really busy. I always joke and I say when I got to the fourth one, I realised what was causing it. And so I put a stop to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Lucy says mine had me up from four till six she's exhausted again if that's a constant problem Lucy do check out that sleep webinar like I said on the Sunshine Academy because uh, Kerry goes into a lot of detail about what causes those regular wake-ups at certain times um, but it is you know the minute your child has a disturbed night's sleep it's like you're transported back to those newborn days and we're just not I mean I'm not used to that if I have if one of my kids is ill I am an absolute zombie nightmare the following day my husband is sat right there and he's nodding so clearly I am a zombie nightmare um <clears throat> Sadie says thank you yes PDA too it's a struggle but good advice PDA is hard and there is no one size fits all. And I know a lot of people, they try and share resources saying, if you definitely do it this way, then it will work. It doesn't. It doesn't with PDA. And also remember, one of the most exhausting parts of being a parent to a child with PDA is that they're really, really, really intelligent. So what happens is they work out what you're doing and then they go, oh, I've just worked it out. I'm not doing it now. And so you've got to constantly look for new tools in your toolbox to be able to try and move forward with them. And it's really, really hard. Um, I have a lot of experience in the field of PDA. As a parent, I've also gone on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of training sessions. I have sat physically with the clinical researchers. I have listened to all the updates. Um, in fact, I'm very up to date with, with everything that's happening in the world of PDA because we just recently had a full day of PDA at our Sunshine Hub in Derby. Um, and I think that the common denominator is we don't know. Everybody says the same thing. There is no diagnostic tool for PDA because we don't know. We can't get to the root of what it is that it that you know what is PDA. We understand how it presents. Um, <clears throat> we understand that it's different to, to regular demand avoidance. It PDA is different to extreme demand avoidance. But there's so many question marks 
And we are moving forward at a very, very, very quick pace with all the research and the development on it. And, you know, the, the professionals who are involved are incredible. We've got a webinar coming up on PDA as well, actually. Um, I think it's in September. It's with Phil Christie. He's part of the, the PDA professionals group in the UK. And we're by far the leading com uh, country on PDA. So um, it's going to be quite interesting to see what Phil says. I love listening to him. Uh, sorry, I've just done a bit of a squirrel moment again and gone off in a different direction. But PDA, yeah, absolutely so difficult. And I think you end up doing a lot of sort of fumbling around in the dark <laughs> because you just don't know. You don't know what works and what works today won't work tomorrow, but it might work next week. Yeah, hard work. Absolutely hard work. Um, OK, let me see what other comments I've got. It's not ideal the way that Facebook has me work looking hard for your comments this morning. I fear that somebody is heckling me with the looks that my husband's giving me. Are you heckling me? No? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Laura says, we are increasingly finding in Hampshire that once a child gets a diagnosis of autism, they use it as an umbrella for everything else that's going on. Oh my God, that, that's just like an age old problem, Laura. I'm really sorry to say. Um, so there are many children, including my own, with very complex needs that aren't being diagnosed properly. So I remember from my own experience about five years ago, five and a half years ago, um, the amazing Libby Hill. She's an incredible speech and language therapist, but she's so much more than that. You know, that is her official title. But what she doesn't know about just send is not worth knowing. Libby sat with me and... Uh, assessed one of my children and she said I am 100% confident she has something called developmental language disorder however a lot of the professionals around my child at the time kept saying that we think she's autistic and she said she might be autistic let you know let's allow that to sort of come to its own it'll come in in time however if we go down the route of diagnosing her now or assessing her for autism and potentially getting a diagnosis, her speech and language needs are never going to be addressed. However, I know for a fact that she has developmental language disorder. So I'm going to lead with that because DLD is the only uh, sp uh, learning difficulty that has scientific research attached to it that shows that it improves with bespoke interventions so I was all ears and she said because otherwise it will be forever that people say she won't ever be able to do that because she's autistic she can't do that oh it's because she's autistic oh yeah that problem that she's presenting with yeah it's because she's autistic rather than saying forget the autism let's help the child with this problem that they're presenting with and um, I trust Libby implicitly. She's the only person, her and her team are the only ones that assess my children um, for speech and language um, needs. And uh, I'm so glad I did, because actually we're five years on, five and a half years on, and the child that was then presenting with difficulties at age four and a half, five, is light years away from the child that I have now. Um, she has come on leaps and bounds. And so I'm really, really happy that we didn't proceed down the autism route. It works out. She does, she's not autistic. She is very DLD. Um, but her difficulties this year alone, um, I did her annual review in July. And in 11 months, she had progressed in her speech and language, in certain areas of her speech and language and her emotional uh, development. She had progressed in 11 months two years and seven months and that's what happens when you have the right interventions and the right support and the right speech and language therapy approaches um, and these are the things that get missed when you have this uh this sort of diagnosis a big diagnosis because it is a big diagnosis autism or adhd then the, nobody seems to want to help but actually, what should be happening is once you have that diagnosis, there should be several other assessments that happen afterwards. And if you can stretch to go in private, I would absolutely recommend it because it'll be the best money you'll ever spend on your child. I remember going through this with one of mine and we just said, right, we're not going to have holidays. There'll be no takeaways. 
we'll downgrade our car. We will now be a one car family. So we'll have to get rid of one car. We got rid of everything. I went right back to basics in order to afford all these medical fees to make sure that we were getting the speech and language assessments in and they were the right ones and getting the occupational uh, therapy. That's the ones you need to focus on. So we always say there's three assessments really that should be happening to assess a child's needs post that diagnosis. So if you have an autism diagnosis, go for speech and language therapy assessment, go for an occupational therapy, sensory integration. It has to be sensory integration, not a regular OT. Um, so get that assessment. And of course, educational psychology, um, because until you have those three things, and of course, if your child is presented with physical problems, there'll be other physical things as well that you need to, to get assessed. And maybe you need to go to a, uh, what are they called? I haven't got the word in my brain, like a physical therapist. Can't think what they're called. Anyway, one of those. I can't remember what they're called now. What are they called? Physical therapist. You know where you go? Physio. <laughs> like a physio. Yeah. So you need to go there. Sorry. Just drawing a blank. I need to drink more of that drink. Um, <clears throat> because you need to unpick what their needs are. Because as Katie and our team always says, so Katie has done some brilliant visual resources that she's going to be sharing soon. But she always says that with neurodivergence, you know, if you if you're autistic, autism is your ice cream and the toppings are all your different types of need. You know, just because you're autistic doesn't mean you're the same as the next autistic person. Everybody presents differently. Everybody's needs are different. Um, you might have an autistic child who is nonverbal. You might have an autistic child who is very verbal and uh, doesn't mean they can communicate, though. So. I could go on and on and on about this. So I'm really frustrated as well, Laura. And I think that we forget when, when we have those big um, diagnostic papers or, or letters or report that says this child is autistic or this child has ADHD, um, they then forget that there are needs that need to be addressed and you just get left with nothing. And so it's really hard then. It's even harder then to try and find someone to help them during the um, holidays. Um, Lucy also asks what are new tropics um, I'm glad that I think that must be Katie that's uh, jumped on there do have a look give a google to Will Powders incredible brand really really ethical very very clean haven't got um, ultra processed anything in them um, and everything just makes everything feel much better in my drink this morning I have uh, new tropics and collagen that is my morning drink, and that will keep me fueled throughout the morning. Um, Katie says, another thing I've noticed with the clubs and childcare, even if it exists for SEND, it's usually linked to a SEND school. But as I'm sure we all know, most kids at SEND schools have to travel to get to school. And so it can be quite a long journey. So it's not really feasible during the summer holidays for families who rely upon the school taxis. Absolutely. And also, not all SEND children go to specialist schools or special schools. Some of them, their needs can be met in a mainstream school. So for one of my children, my DLD, her, she's in a mainstream school with a, a full-time one-to-one. Um, and she has speech and language therapy. So she has a very um, special educational provision. And it, of course, she's got an EHCP. Of course she has. Um, however, would she necessarily meet the criteria for one of those SEND clubs? Probably not. Does she need a SEND club that understands her and understands what speech and language uh, needs are? Yes. And actually, a regular holiday club wouldn't meet uh, wouldn't fit the bill for her so it's really tricky really really tricky and like I say can you imagine how expensive that is because if you if your child is regularly um, needing a teacher for the group and they want one if you are having to fund that yourself that's going to get really really pricey of course it is and people deserve to be paid you're not you can't expect people to work for free so you know times are tough so it's really, really hard. Um, Laura says, it's almost like they think, well, that, that'll get an EHCP sorted. So what more do you need? They fail to see that it shuts the door to all the medical help a child should be getting. So yeah, going back to the um, autism diagnosis. Yeah, 
absolutely. They, they, they're not seeing the bigger picture. I think a lot of people, when they get their diagnosis, they feel so alone because they wait for that diagnosis thinking it's going to be the magic wand. It's not the magic wand. You just know a little bit more. And in fact, you don't know that much. You just need to know a word. Quite often, they don't leave you with like, I paid for my child's autism assessment. And that was a 20 or 30 page report that told me all about how her brain functions. It told me about her speech and language needs because a speech and language therapist was involved in the ADOS 2 assessment. It was a multidisciplinary assessment, an incredible assessment. Um, and it gave us such an enormous insight. <clears throat> but if you go into the NHS route, I've seen some appalling work being done where the child is not even autistic and they've diagnosed them as autistic and they've given them just a letter. They've not given them an explanation. They've not told them what assessments they 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 did. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh yeah, they just observed, observed my child playing with cars for 20 minutes and said that they're autistic. That is not an autism assessment. Um, Rachel says, sounds fab. Why can't all professionals listen to children and parents? It's a question I ask all the time. However, however, um, we are making big strides with this, Rachel. And I must say, we have an incredible education team here at Sunshine. So um, we have Kelly Jarvis, who you've probably seen lots of times online. Um, Kelly is a very, very experienced specialist head teacher of a residential school for very complex children um, who are typically autistic and a lot of them have PDA and all the different things that are thrown in with that. So you can imagine the complexities that, that she's worked with. Um, Kelly leads our team of advocates and consultants. And within that team, we have Gabby who is an incredible Senko. Gabby's also a speech and language um, teacher. So again, what she doesn't know about things like DLD is not worth knowing. She is fantastic. Um, we have Lindsay, who is a very experienced head teacher of a mainstream school, but has her own lived experience within SEND. And so she's really, really passionate about this. Um, and we also have Emily, who's just joined us this week, and she is an assistant Senko with an incredible experience and lived experience herself as well. And what we are doing with this amazing team of educators is they are going into schools and they are empowering teachers. They're empowering teachers and in encouraging them and inspiring them and motivating them to listen. And also encouraging them to understand that actually the magic wand they need is usually the parent. So coaxing that information out of a parent can often lead to a better provision can lead to better outcomes working together co-production as they call it in the field um and we are making huge amounts of um development and i must say if any teachers are watching please do get in touch because lindsay is launching our senko network and teacher network this is going to be something that's online and in person, and it's going to mirror what we do for parents. So there'll be cuppa and chats, there'll be supervision sessions, there will be opportunities to come in and speak to the specialist educators about specific cases or specific children that you're working with, uh, really pick the brains of our team. Um, and the level of input that we will be having to make sure the teachers feel listened because I think a lot of the time teachers don't feel listened to, they don't feel value, valued, they don't feel validated. All the things that we feel as parents, the teachers are also feeling in their field. Um, and, and so they're exhausted. They're absolutely exhausted. So we've got some big things that are going to be happening in September onwards. So if you know a teacher or you are a teacher or you know of a school who would be really open to this and really wanting to learn more, tell them to send us a message. They can either email us through our website or come to our Facebook page um, and Lindsay can have a chat to them. Um, let me see. Lucy says, I like this one. Um, I don't like it, Lucy. Sorry, but you'll understand what I mean. I'm struggling with planning because of my ADHD. I find summer hard as my eldest needs advance notice. That's me. I live in chaos, which is why I have lists all the time of everything. I have one book and my life revolves around this book. And I also have bits in my phone and I found a way of working that works for me. Um, <clears throat> usually I print off a uh, blank calendar 
that I stick on the wall. I haven't done it this year, actually, because we've done it something a little bit different this year with our kids. But every summer I print off a blank calendar and I stick it on the wall. And that is what we center those conversations around. When are we having our down days? When are we having our days of activity? What will they be? And sometimes having that visual of knowing when things are happening and also planning in when you're going to do your planning. So saying, you know, on Thursday, the, we're going to be doing, we're going to the zoo. That's what you've decided to do. So what we're going to do is the Thursday before, we're going to do some social stories around the zoo. The Monday before that, we're going to do this activity. Plan all your planning into your diary I always assume that I will forget I will always forget so I plan around that I plan for my forgetfulness it's something I always say to my team just assume that you'll forget you won't store it up there you'll forget you're too busy plan for your forgetfulness plan for your lack of planning I know this sounds crazy but it's something I do a lot um in my diary I have prompts to do more prompts <laughs> and to some that sounds crazy but it works really really well for me and my adhd brain so i hope that helps um angie says my son developed pda traits when he began high school how do i get a pda profile done he's 13 has autism and speech and language difficulties i'm finding him to be very challenging he wants to game screen time i have a screen screen time chart I'm using at the moment, which is helping. I have an older son with autism who wants to go out and do activities. The youngest doesn't want to go out. I feel really guilty. Lack of sleep has caught up with me. Also worried about September as my eldest is due to start college. He's always struggled with transition. Okay, Angie, breathe. There is so much going on here. Um, PDA is very rare. It could be your child has PDA, but I would also ask you to consider two other things there might be other things as well but there's two things that are screaming to me here pans pandas please do give it a, a google or look at pans pandas uk that's going to be the, the best bet or ping us a message and we can send you some resources typically pda doesn't just start midway through life you tend to see the signs leading up to that point so when somebody then talks to you about PDA, you can say, oh, yeah, I remember this from age two or age three. And it doesn't tend to just happen. Pans pandas can, however, and post COVID, we're seeing more of it. So I am no expert on pans pandas, but I know enough to know to, to sign post you. Um, Gabby, who I've just already mentioned um, in our team, is very well versed with pans pandas so if you want her to help you um she's also very well versed with pda so she, she might be somebody that you you find very very interesting to talk to um it could also be trauma so demand avoidance let's take the p off demand avoidance can be for a variety of different reasons and i know i've done you know have a look at our videos because i've done tons on this have a look on my instagram as well for anybody who's who's still watching please do have a look as i post daily content on my instagram page um and you'll find that very validating and well i hope you do um but it also gives you an insight to different things whether that's adhd pda autism whatever um, demand avoidance is actually very common and it's also very common when a child starts high school now one of my kids has just come to the end of year seven and when she started year seven I said to her she's very bright she's a September baby she's always done very well academically because of that but also she's very bright she's an incredible kid and I said to her I want you to not focus on learning this year and she's like, OK, you weirdo. Well, why would you say that? And I said, because I want us to sit down and talk about what the differences are between primary and secondary, because we always assume our kids will manage it. We assume because we did. Or did we? I didn't. Um, we assume because for decades, that's what has happened. So therefore, you go from primary to secondary. And yeah, you know, it's emotional and everything else. Just get on with it. So I sat, sat down with her and I said, let's have a little think. What do we think are the biggest differences between primary and secondary? And we came up with a whole heap of stuff. You know, the fact that you have different teachers for different subjects, the fact you have to move between lessons, you have new friends. You know, our school is enormous, our local secondary. There's about 2,000 kids there. 
and they come from, I don't know, something like eight feeder schools. So she's going to be meeting loads of new people. Um, and also, let's explore that a little bit. At the moment, you know your place and your ranking, if you like, in your sort of friendship demographic or dynamic. That is all going to change because you're going to be moved away from your friends. You're going to be making new friends. But now you have to find your place in these new friendship groups. How are they going to work out? How will you learn to trust them? Um, let's look at what makes a good friend. Let's let's look at red flags. You know, there's loads to unpick here. And I think my kids are very lucky that I, I know this stuff because I sit through webinars day in, day out. And I learn and I learn and I learn. Webinars are your friend, by the way, for all of this. Um, and so we unpicked it all. And so I said to her, what I want you to focus on this year is the bits that we've identified will be tricky for you. So, you know, things like transitions between classes, um, knowing where you're going to get your food from, paying for your food with your thumbprint and everything, not going over budget, managing that budget. All the things that you don't assume are learning, but actually are going to set you up for good learning later on. And we came to the end of the first term and she said, oh, yeah, I feel really quite shaky about it all. You know, I don't know who my friends are anymore. I thought I discovered them quite quickly. And then I realized they weren't particularly loyal and really feel like they've upset me, actually. And I don't know about some of my teachers. So we went through all of that at the beginning of the first term. Then we got her first report, which basically said that she's an incredible kid. Very, very good. Her behavior is excellent. Um, However, her grades were very, very, very low. And that blew her mind. She was like, oh my God, see, I should have focused on my grades. And I said, no, trust the process. And from that, she trusted me. And I said, I do know what I'm doing. I promise you, I've done this before. Um, trust me, I know what I'm doing. She then went on to continue to work on those things. So all the things I've just discussed thinking very much about her senses because she's very aware of her senses. It's something I coach her in and um, meeting her needs, understanding what emotional regulation is, knowing how to self-advocate, knowing the difference between self-advocacy and how successful you can be with that and being rude <laughs> and understanding that and know knowing her place in that school and knowing that she's a very valued member of the community. And she has ended the year with the most phenomenal grades that she put no effort into, by the way, because actually she was focusing all, on all the other stuff. All the other stuff makes it work. Because if a child can understand their place in a school and understand they're a very valued member of the community and they feel included and they feel welcome, and by the way, her head teacher is very inclusive, then it may makes the rest of it just fall into place. The learning will happen because the brain is open. It's like you make it, you tick all the boxes, you make it nice and happy, and then it just opens for information and she can focus on this information. And I did that because my elder child didn't have that from me because I didn't understand stuff like that back then. And that's where her demand avoidance really kicked in. So it could very much be PDA is what I'm saying as well. It could be demand avoidance, which is different to PDA. PDA is very, very rare. Um, for me, when my daughter was diagnosed with PDA, I then looked back over my previous years and saw where it was. I was like, oh, yes, that's always been there. This isn't a new thing. It's always been there. It just became more heightened in this period of time. Um, we've also got to think about hormones, hormone imbalances. That can also affect the way that we perform tasks and it can also make us very demand avoidant. Um, so this is a very big picture. However, if you want to pursue an assessment, go to somebody who knows their stuff. Somebody like Health for Psychology, Dr. Judy Eaton. Dr. Judy Eaton understands the difference between trauma and PDA because they present very, very different, uh, very, very similarly. We've got a webinar coming up on the 20th of August that will show you. It's with Gary Lane. He's a phenomenal psychotherapist. OK, I trust him. This is why I've got him to speak for us, because he is incredible. And what he's explained to me has blown my mind and he's given me a different way of looking at things. Um, Gary, his qualifications are longer than I can actually, longer than I am. Um, he will be talking a lot about this. He'll be talking about how that transition into school, because we will be talking about trauma and how it affects our nervous system 
and how we can make us demand avoidant and how we get our children out of that. Um, again, there's lots of options here. So I would definitely look at pans pandas. I would go to, you know, if you want to, it would have to be a private assessment. I wouldn't trust the NHS to be able to do this level of assessment for you. You'll get the wrong results. Um, somebody like Dr. Judy Eaton, Health for Psychology is a fantastic, or I don't know if he's still practicing because sometimes I think he is and sometimes I don't think he is, but another phenomenal, absolutely incredible um, psychiatrist, psychologist, I'm not too sure, but he's a doctor, he's fantastic. And he's also worked with Dr. Judy Eaton, is Dr. Richard Soppet. Do look those people up. They're absolutely phenomenal. Um, also look at Libby Hill because Libby, can also do quite a lot of different speech and language assessments to determine that level of um, demand avoidance. And she'll be able to sort of unpick quite a bit for you. Um, but also do consider trauma. If you look at our previous videos on Facebook, you'll see tons on trauma because I talk about trauma all the time. Look at my Instagram page, I talk about trauma all the time. I'm obsessed with trauma. Um, not experiencing it, but talking about it. Um, but do have a look because I think pans, pandas, PDA, trauma, demand avoidance, neurodivergence, hormones, could be anything. And I don't know your son and I'm not an expert in these things, but I know how to signpost you. So look at all those areas. I hope that that helps. Um, okay, I can't believe how quickly that hour's gone, guys. Um, so... I'm going to bring the Facebook Live to an end. I hope you found it really, really useful. If you need us, don't be a stranger. Just send us a message. If something I've said doesn't sound right, or perhaps you've got more questions, or you can't quite understand what I'm talking about, please do just ping us a message. We'll absolutely help you. We've got tons and tons of resources as well. When you look at our Sunshine Academy, it's a bit like Netflix. So you pay a monthly subscription, but you have access to everything on there. And on there, we've got hundreds of webinars. We've got home learning for children that's developing all the time. We've got full length podcasts. So they're much longer than our Spotify podcasts. We have got meditation and self-care. We've got all sorts of stuff. And we've got courses that I've never seen before. So we develop courses for Sunshine Academy. And you can dip in and out as you want. One of the most valuable things for me about the Sunshine Academy is there's an area called the community area. And you can post your questions and the advocates, our advocates and consultants respond to you. It's brilliant. Honestly, it's absolutely amazing. So you're in effect getting your questions answered as you go along. Um, so I would recommend anybody who is on this send journey to just get over and on there because it's so much more bespoke than anything I do on a Facebook Live. Um, we also have on there, for those who want to know more about the PDA, there is tons on there about PDA, tons on there about autism, ADHD, pans pandas. We have stuff on there for pans pandas as well. Sleep, like I've mentioned. Um, and also school avoidance and the return to school. We've got loads going on. In fact, we've got a webinar this week on uh, managing your child's anxiety regarding the return to school. Um, we've got some brilliant webinars over the summer, actually, to help you get your child prepared for September. Although I know that some kids have already gone back, haven't they, which is mad. Um, but if you need our help, it's there. You know, just grab it with both hands. And if you need any links to anything, just send us a message or comment and we'll absolutely help you out. But it's been lovely chatting to everybody this morning. Um, keep sleeping and drinking. And if you get your hands on this stuff, absolutely do it because it will keep you going. It will fuel your summer. Um, but if you need us, don't suffer in silence. Just get in touch. OK, have a fantastic summer, guys.